Welcome, people, to a live episode of The Watchdog with me, Low Key. As you know, at Mint Press, we provide you regularly with confrontational investigative journalism, which you find nowhere in the mainstream media. For that reason, I would encourage you all to support us now on Indiegogo, on Patreon, and other places where you can access Mint Press's vital and important work. In addition to that, I would say please like, share, and subscribe with this video. Now, this week we have a special episode in which we are joined by the editor-in-chief of Mint Press, Manara Adli, and also we are hoping to be joined by Joe Luria from Consortium News regarding this recent campaign against independent news websites where they have seen their services not only cut off, but in, it seemed initially the seizure of their money taking place by the very important app PayPal. Um, it's happened along with other organizations who have an independent line on US foreign policy and the activities of NATO around the world. It would be great to get Joe's perspective. We hope he will be joining us momentarily. But firstly, we can speak to Manar and bring her in to explain to us what exactly has happened with Mint Press's PayPal account? Um, we will get Manar onto the screen in a second. Manar, if you can join us, fantastic. We we can't actually hear you. <laughs> Sorry, Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Loki, for hosting today's live stream. Um, yeah, you know, we we were contacted by PayPal uh, late last week, notifying myself and Mint Press that we could no longer use PayPal permanently and that they would hold our funds for 180 days. And in fact, after 180 days, there would be an investigation on our funds and uh, they could seize that amount. Any balance that we would have, they would seize that. And so uh, we were the Say first... What? We were the first to announce um, that we were the first to announce that PayPal had uh, banned us, and then later we learned that Caleb Maupin, he's an independent journalist, formerly with RT though, um, and then also Joe Loria, um, who's joining us today from Consortium News, uh, their uh, website was banned from PayPal as well, and so PayPal banning myself and Mint Press. Uh, is blatant censorship of dissenting journalists and outlet uh, outlets, and you know there's no question that for the past decade, Mint Press um, has been unapologetically working as a watchdog journalism outlet to expose the profiteers of the permanent war state. Uh, you know, going back from the wars to Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, to apartheid Israel's uh, ongoing occupation of Palestine and Saudi Arabia's genocidal war in Yemen to the many regime change operations in Syria, Ukraine, and Venezuela, where we have seen US weapons uh, flooding these nations to plunge them into devastating uh, civil wars. And right now we've entered wartime um, with the war in Ukraine raging on. And so we have, we're living now in an intellectual no-fly zone where online censorship has basically become uh, the new norm against uh, dissenting journalism. And so what we believe has happened is that the U.S. sanctions regime that is trying to starve Russia, that's trying to starve Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Cuba, and Iran, and over 25% of the world's population is now targeting its own citizens uh, with its maximum pressure campaign so that we are forced to toe the official line in order to survive as journalists and independent media uh, today. Yeah. And two questions, Manar. Firstly, as far as I understood, initially, Mint Press's funds that were kept within PayPal were seized. What is the status of the Mint Press funds within PayPal now? 
So we received a notice from PayPal um, actually just two days ago, uh, notifying us that our funds um, can be released now. We can access our own funds and that we can transfer them back to our bank account. So this obviously goes in contrast to the original message from last week that they, were be, they would be held for 180 days and be under investigation. So what I, believed ha what I believe has happened is that uh, it was from the outpouring and swell of support that we have received um, over the weekend, uh, PayPal was actually trending on Twitter because of our announcement and Consortium Moon's announcement that uh, PayPal had banned and seized our accounts. And so now uh, across the you know Twitter sphere of conversations, um, our ban and the ban against independent journalists and media outlets uh, was a, a big discussion and conversation. So we really appreciate everybody who had come out uh, to support us and to defend us. Um, uh, the coverage of this made it to many news outlets and um, we were interviewed by several, you know, uh, pundits like Matt Taibbi. And so we got some very positive uh, coverage about this. And I just want to mention too, that over the weekend, there was the correspondence dinner at the White House when we were banned from PayPal. And while all independent media outlets, pretty much every single one of them had covered mid press being banned, not a single corporate mainstream media outlet or pundit had covered the fact that on Press Freedom Day, uh, PayPal was seizing the funds and accounts of independent media outlets. They were whining and dining at the White House, talking about press freedom, talking about how they are acting as watchdogs <laughs> to the powers that be, how they were basically uh, engaging uh, successfully as the fourth estate. Meanwhile, not a single word was uh, talked about when it came to PayPal's ban. And of course, they're sitting there whining and dining, talking about this while... Uh, on press freedom day with no mention of course of the fact that julian assange is sitting behind bars for his amazing work at wikileaks in exposing the national security state and war crimes and of course all of these pundits and all of these journalists um, that were at this uh correspondence dinner uh have had no problem promoting the permanent war state and promoting a nato agenda when it comes to the war in ukraine they are continuously promoting a nuclear war with russia and cheerleading that on as if it's nothing. And so we really appreciate all the support that we've received from um, the independent media. Welcome, Joe. <laughs> and we've been joined um, by Joe from Consortium News. It's worth mentioning that in several countries, Consortium News's website has gone down. Um, Joe, what is the latest? Thank you for joining us in this, what must be a very tense time what is the latest update on the status of consortium news and its presence on the <clears throat> internet around the world well thank you very much uh loki for having me here i apologize for coming on late and for the video quality i normally use a green screen and a studio light but we've been on and off with our web host to try to get our website back on and we have an enormous technical problems we don't really know the reason for this i cannot say that we were this was some kind of an attack at this point. It could be a, another technical issue, but we're trying to resolve that. We're periodically coming on and off stream in different countries, although Google chat at the moment shows two people who are online, one in Brazil and one in Serbia. I'd like to get in touch with those two people, see what's going on, why they are so privileged. No, I, I think that's all screwed up as well. But as Minar pointed out, we got exactly the same message as she, as she did and the others, uh, McLeod and the others at Mint Press News, um, which said for no reason whatsoever that they shut us down uh, and they were holding our funds. And it was a permanent limitation, which is the word they're using, a permanent ban. We can never use PayPal ever again. And I called a customer service agent, I actually got a human being. And I think she gave away a little more than she actually wanted to or should have, because she did say that, in fact, they were holding the funds. They would hold it for up to 80, 180 days, after which they would make an assessment about whether they returned the funds to us or not, and that they could award themselves damages. Now, I looked up the, the legal language and the user agreement, and indeed, they, if they could hold on to these funds if they are somehow liable for anything that we may have done illegally that implicated them because they were involved as the, uh, as the payment system. And that, if you look at the things that are banned, you know, obviously you can't sell firearms, drugs, drug paraphernalia, you can't promote 
uh, use the money for terror, you know, felonies, essentially. So clearly we were not involved in any of that. I don't think they thought we were involved in any of that. Of course, we don't know because they didn't say what we were involved in. But then if you keep looking, it does say that uh, amongst the restricted activities is providing, quote, uh, false or misleading information, close quote, to PayPal, to other PayPal customers, or to a third party, which could be the public, our audience, our readers. So we, one could only assume, given the political climate that we're in, that that was the reason why we were shut down. Of course, PayPal has this relationship with the American uh, Defamation League. Uh, just as Facebook has one with Atlantic Council, they should be, yes, a public utility. They should be independent, neutral, just facilitating a service. But no, they've taken on this role of, of managing information, that any information that goes against the, the only narrative that's allowed, especially on the Ukraine war, that's being enforced. You know, you can disagree with us. You can say we're full of crap. That's fine. Uh, and you don't have to read our website. Why? Uh, who are these people to shut us down? To try to shut us down, it's because they're afraid of a little spark, a spark like Mint Press News, like Consorting. We have ten thousand readers a day, and it went up to forty during the once the Ukraine war started. There was a lot of hunger for a different point of view, which we are constitutionally protected to provide. It's simply a point of view. Again, you don't have to agree with us, but just leave us alone. But no, they're not leaving us alone. They have to try to crush even the slightest little bit of dissent, yet lest those sparks become a fire. And this is total control of a narrative, and the word total is in totalitarian. So I hate to use these extreme words, censorship, fascism, totalitarianism. But I'm going to use the T word, because I think this is a totalitarian uh, thrust that we're uh, that Minar and I and others are victims of because they will not tolerate another viewpoint of this war. And what are, what is our viewpoint on this war? We're not supporting either side in this war. That's the problem, probably. We're not standing with Ukraine. We're not standing with Russia. We're trying to give the causes of the war. You know, we have had published many many articles on Ukraine for which we've been praised as well as roundly condemned. And what are those articles essentially seek is to explain the causes of this war. Now, you have an historian, All the, most historians today will say that the Versailles Treaty was one of the cause, and the onerous terms on Germany was one of the causes for the rise of Nazis in World War II. That's not excusing what Nazi Germany did, clearly. But you're not allowed to do that in real time, i.e. journalism, where you explain what were the causes of that, and what were the causes. Yes, the unbridled NATO expansionism eastward that broke the agreement that Gorbachev was given. The the fact that the Russians pre presented in 2009 and again in December of last year proposals in, in last December treaty proposals with the U.S. and NATO that would just create a new security architecture in Europe that would take Russia's security into account. In other words, take out NATO troops that were deployed in the Eastern European new NATO states. Not that they would leave NATO, but that there would be no diplomacy. And these missiles in Poland and in Romania would be also removed because they have offensive potentiality and very close minutes from Moscow and other Russian cities. They also uh, were pushing the Minsk Accords. That was an agreement that ended the, that was supposed to end the war that the coup regime, and by the way, we're not allowed to talk about the coup, the 2014 coup of which there's abundant circumstantial evidence and a smoking gun of the U.S. Secretary of, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland speaking with the American ambassador in Ukraine, which they discussed who would be in a new government in Ukraine, maybe months before that government was violently overthrown. In an unconstitutional change of government, a man, Yanukovych, whatever you thought of him, Viktor Yanukovych, was his election was certified by the, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE. I even once questioned the president of the, the head of the OSCE at that time. I was based at the UN for 25 years. And when the Ukraine thing broke out, I had, was able to question uh, an angry Yatsunuk. And Yatsunuk was the guy that Victoria Nuland wanted to put in. And he got put in as the prime minister. So that it cannot be discussed. The 2014 U.S. back coup, the U.S. involvement in that violent overthrow. Second of all, you cannot really talk about the role of Nazism in Ukraine, which is clearly the mainstream media reported all of that at the time. There's no doubt that Ukraine is probably the only state in the world that has incorporated 
neo-Nazi battalions and a regiment into their own state military, in part under the under the control of the Interior Ministry. Um, and the Minsk Accords, you can't discuss, or these NATO proposals. And the Min what happened after the coup, of course, was that the coup government uh, went to war against its own people, which were Russian speakers in the east of the country, bordering Russia in the Donbass region, who resisted the coup. They had voted for Yanukovych. They didn't recognize this new government. They declared independence. The war began, went on for eight years. There was this Minsk Accord to try to end it. And Germany and, and France were parties to that. And, and the US, those three countries never really pressured the governments in Kiev to implement those accords. So that's all we're talking. Russia felt threatened. You can't say that. They felt threatened by NATO expansion. They felt threatened by this war against their own speakers in uh, in the Donbass region. They felt threatened by the fact that Ukraine had become a Na de facto NATO state, where they were being armed, trained, and had joint exercises with NATO nations. So I, we do not say that the invasion, was, I think it was a mistake because I wrote in February 4, this was a trap that the U.S. was setting for Russia by, by instigating a new offensive against the Donbass Russian speakers. And that was clearly happening by OSCE maps and statistics that most of the shelling was happening from the government side into the Donbass region across the line of confrontation that had been there for eight years. And the, Russia would have to make a choice to sacrifice those people, to be slaughtered, or to go in and and uh, and protect them. And I said, as soon as they go in to protect them, that's going to be the invasion that the Americans were screaming about. Remember those weeks before? Invasion, invasion, invasion. Uh, and then they would be able to institute their information war, which they have, and we're part of. I think we're victims of that, both Minar and, and I, and of uh, the economic war especially, which was unprecedented sanctions against Russia, the Russian Central Bank, against the exports of raw materials that are desperately needed, not only in the developing world, but in the West as well. That's driving this inflation, which, yes, was already existent, but has increased and is costing Western politicians uh, a lot of anger amongst their own pop population, whereas Russia, joining with India and China, as well as most of Africa and Latin America, in rejecting these sanctions and joining this economic war, that Russia and China are building a new uh, commercial, monetary, and financial system separating themselves from the West. It's, the West has cut their nose off despite their face because the, the globalization that America was driving is weakened because they're losing most of the world. Most of the world's population is not standing with the United States on this. So I'll just stop by saying it's a proxy war of the US. These are the kinds of things of everything I've just said are the articles that we are publishing that somehow people at PayPal for whatever reason and they won't explain, didn't think was, um, uh, was something that could make them liable for publishing what they call disinformation. And that's why I believe they shut us down and probably uh, Mint Press News as well. And uh, what we have is a partial victory because our funds were released. And yeah. as soon as I heard about that, I immediately took everything out of PayPal. Uh, but they have not restored us. They've now asked us to take steps to get it restored, whereas before we were permanently banned and there were no steps that you could take. So... Uh, I'm going to ask them. I don't know if I'm going to get any clear answers about what, what the reason was. I doubt they'll admit that it was because of the things that we published. Could I could I just add a, a quick point to what you were saying about uh, this crackdown um, on dissenters? Uh, right now, there's clearly a major uh, a heavy handed witch hunt taking place against dissenting journalists to control uh, the narrative about the war in Ukraine. And I do think it is because of what you said, Joe, um, that we are living in an era with a in a declining US empire where the United States is winning the war or losing the war, excuse me, overseas. And so right now we have the New York Times uh, writing smear campaigns against dissenting journalists uh, like Benjamin Norton and saying that it's a conspiracy theory that there was a coup in uh 2016 the Maidan coup it was not it was 14, not a coup. Yeah. yeah 14 it was not a coup um and then now we have the daily beast that just came out with um a hit piece against max blumenthal danny haypong um i believe uh benjamin norton was in there as well and lee camp and it smeared all of those independent journalists um and treated them with suspect <laughs> because they were reported on many of the statements that the facts that you just stated now uh, calling uh, the 2014 Maidan coup a coup, reporting on the Azov Battalion and the fact that Ukraine is one of the only countries that has literal Nazis um, represented in their government and then also in the military. 
and also treating them as suspect because they're turning to their readers and their viewers for, for funding. But in fact, the New York Times or like the Washington Post, for example, which is owned by Jeff Bezos and has this major conflict of interest that were, you know, has contracts with the CIA and other media outlets like, you know, BuzzFeed or Vice News that work directly with the Board of Broadcasting Governors, which public, which is like a legal arm of the U.S. government to publish, you know, propaganda. That's OK. But to turn to your readers and to be people funded, that's not OK. And so we're just really seeing this major witch hunt against independent journalists and you know, it's exhausting, but we have to continue to push back. And that's why uh, we really appreciate you being here and speaking up and telling us your story today. Oh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you so much, Joe, for coming. You know, we understand it must be a really tough time um, to even be able to come and speak to us. You know, I think the important thing to understand about the Anti-Defamation League and their link with PayPal is that prior to them obtaining this status with PayPal, they had a Silicon Valley command center funded for them by Pierre Omidyar. Now, Pierre Omidyar is not only a large shareholder in PayPal, but he's also the founder of eBay, eBay <clears throat> which used to own PayPal. Um, of course, from using that Silicon Valley command center as a sort of launch pad, the ADL were put in place as one of YouTube's trusted flaggers. You also have them with serious links with Google. Google is part of the ADL's Silicon Valley anti-cyber hate working group. So this is really significant level of integration. Of course, the ADL is the largest um, non-governmental trainer of law enforcement in this in the United States. It's deeply, deeply entrenched um, relationships with the FBI. Um, and regarding this particular um, PayPal relationship, we know that it was announced um, in July 26, uh, 2021, that this partnership was to, quote, fight extremism and hate through the financial industry and across at-risk communities. Um, in addition to that, it said that PayPal and ADL have launched a research effort to address the urgent need to understand how extremists and hate movements throughout the US are attempting to leverage financial platforms to fund criminal activity. The intelligence gathered through this research initiative will be shared broadly across the financial industry and with policymakers and with law enforcement. You know, we know that in FBI internal memos um, as early as 1969, they were questioning whether the Anti-Defamation League were in violation of the foreign agents, the registration of foreign agents law in the United States. And it was said in this FBI memo, and I quote directly, it is incredible to assume that the ADL is not furnished to an official of the Israeli government. So despite that, from 1968, the FBI were officially cooperating with the ADL. The ADL historically um, infiltrated Arab student groups. They infiltrated and spied on anti-apartheid um, organizations. They spied on Desmond Tutu. They spied on Greenpeace as well. So what we see is this sort of outsourcing of the state's um, uh, surveillance um, pushes to an organization like the Anti-Defamation League. And of course, Matt Taibbi approached uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, the head of the ADL, about this and also PayPal's chief risk um, officer asking what was going on regarding Mint Press and Consortium News and others. And he received no response. Um, I think it would also be important to ask you, Manar, you have said previously that the, this story sort of begins in 2010 with PayPal shutting down the account of WikiLeaks. Can you explain what you mean by that, please? So in 2010, uh, PayPal originally uh, blocked uh, WikiLeaks from uh, receiving any sort of donations. And there is no question that they received that uh, as a direct order from the State Department, from the U.S. government. So the backlash against WikiLeaks uh, literally became the blueprint for today's uh, censorship of dissenting voices and economic 
um, financial censorship we're seeing now that's taking place against um, independent journalists. Um, in 2012, an EU parliamentary resolution criticized providers, including PayPal, against this arbitrary economic censorship. And so uh, right now, with like the war in Ukraine uh, raging on, we're seeing this witch hunt taking place against dissenting journalists. And that really, when, when WikiLeaks was targeted, that really became the framework to um, the kind of censorship we saw leading up you know, to uh, other online censorship and purges of online or independent uh, news and journalists that led to outlets like Proper Not, for example, um, ahead of the 2016 election uh, when Hillary Clinton basically declared that she lost because of Russia. She lost because of Russian bots online and Russian propaganda and Russian disinformation. And that WikiLeaks, she accused WikiLeaks of also being uh, a Russian disinformation outlet. And so we saw the rise of proper not, which stands for propaganda or not. And it might as well uh, you know, represent the interests of the State Department and the Pentagon. Because if you look at proper not in the way that it targets uh, journalists, it basically says that if you criticize Obama, if you criticize Hillary Clinton, if you criticize the Democratic Party, if you are critical of NATO, uh, the mainstream media, or express any worry, okay, worry about a nuclear war with Russia, then you could be a Russian disinformation agent. And so uh, how Proper Not got its rise was after uh, WikiLeaks was targeted and basically the Democratic Party through Hillary Clinton <laughs> declared uh, that there was a problem in America, which was Russian uh, disinformation. Then obviously we saw, you know, Russiagate play out for the next like basically decade. Um, but uh, uh, proper not, uh, we saw its rise after the Washington Post uh, covered proper not and covered proper not's list of websites, which included Mint Press News, it included uh, Black Agenda Report and other independent media outlets. Um, kind of consortium news. And consortium, that's right. They did add a consortium <laughs> news in there. And also with a bunch of, you know, very far right wing conspiratorial websites, they kind of mash us all together. Um, and the story basically went viral from the Washington Post. So we have to remember Washington Post is owned by just Jeff Bezos, another billionaire. And so after the story went um, viral, the reason why we have to really be worrisome about prop or not is because after that story went viral, we saw Facebook purge thousands of pages um, that were critical of U.S. empire, that were critical of the U.S. police state. Many of those that were purged were on proper knots list. So that list was taken very seriously um, by uh, the establishment within big tech. And part of our um, coverage of proper knot is that we believe, and we don't know 100%, but we believe it is run by Michael Wise, um, he is a very hawkish, uh, he's a non-hawkish uh, neoliberal, he's a non-resident senior fellow of NATO, um, the NATO think tank, uh, the Atlantic Council. And so um, this also triggered Google to launch its Project OWL, which was a, ma a massive overhaul of its algorithm, which ended up resulting in Mint Press losing 90% of its organic Google traffic. Um, and other websites. I know Consortium News lost, lost uh, a lot of traffic as well, but it resulted in the purging of independent dissenting websites, uh, also far right and conspiratorial websites that happened as well. But it also affected the way that big tech targeted um, indie websites through its algorithm. And we saw that firsthand with how we were uh, treated. I know Consortium was as well. Yes. Um, and, you know, the thing with Prop or Not is a brilliant Mint Press investigation looked at the administrative dashboard of um, uh, found, scanned Prop or Not and found the administrative dashboard was actually belonged to interpretermag.com. That, of course, is a project of the Atlantic Council. And as you said, Manar, Michael Wise is the editor in chief at the Interpreter Mag and also natural, uh, national security analyst for CNN. Um, so Prop or Not included Consortium News among these 200 uh, websites, which were supposedly, according to them, 
Russian propaganda outlets. Joe, do you remember when this happened and what was the direct effect on Consortium uh, News's operations? When that happened, uh, Robert Perry, our founding editor, 1995, he founded Consortium News, one of the oldest, if not the oldest, independent news site in the country, if not in the world. Uh, we came online five days before Salon.com, just to give you an idea. Months before the LA Times and New York Times went online. 1995 is a long time ago. Bob, of course, was famous because of his uh, Iran Contra reporting. He's the one who revealed Oliver North's role. The AP actually spiked that story. It only went out because it was inadvertently pub uh, translated and went out on the AP Spanish wire, uh, which of course was read all across Latin America uh, and Nicaragua included. So the AP had to publish it. That's how that story got out. Now he, he went to Newsweek after that, he was angry. And the same thing happened there. They were spiking his stories that were critical of the Reagan administration or the US foreign policy policy in general. So he quit that and started news for uh, journalists. That's why it's called consortium, a consortium of journalists whose articles were also spiked by the corporate media because they were too critical, even though they were true. Uh, and he brought together journalists and he started uh, this website that broke a lot of um, new stories. We were, uh, consortium news was in the forefront of debunking the WMD story in Iraq. And certainly in Russiagate, Bob was one of the first. Aaron Mateus credited him for having inspired him and led him to do his work on Russiagate. I wrote a lot of Russiagate stories for them. I started writing for Consortium News in 2012 when I was still a Wall Street Journal reporter. I have a corporate media background like Bob did. I worked for the Boston Globe, the Sunday Times of London, the, the Wall Street Journal based at the UN in New York for 25 years. Um, uh, and I couldn't get stories in the journal. Let's say there was a vote at the General Assembly about the Palestinians becoming an observer state. And I kept writing stories saying that um, that there were there were 130 countries in the world that recognized Palestine. They, some of them had ambassadors in their countries. And they kept cutting that out of my stories. You know, so I got fed up and I contacted Bob Perry and I said, I want to write this story. And he took it. And so I had a contract with the journal. I wasn't on the staff. So I there was no prohibition for me for writing for other publications, uh, even though I had a monthly uh, uh, retainer with the journal. And they, they never discovered that till the very end that I was writing for them. That was one of the reasons they got rid of me. It was the best thing ever happened to get out of the Wall Street Journal. Obviously, I had many battles with them, not everything. I picked my spots. But that was that is what Consortium News is all about. So when Proper Not did that, Bob was still alive and he was the editor. So I don't really know the effects of that. I can't talk about that. But can I ask Menara a question? Uh, after Proper Not came something else that uh, also went after you called NewsGuard, could you tell yeah. us about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So NewsGuard came after Mint Press shortly after. And I think what Proper Not did was basically set up the stage for um, online censorship uh, through these big tech platforms. And so what NewsGuard did is they contacted me um, to ask me, uh, you know, these questions about, you know, why we cover, why we cover Iran and why we're pro-Assad and really like really bizarre kind of framed questions that were pretty loaded, which showed me that they had an agenda. And so um, I contacted our main senior staff writer at that time, which was Whitney Webb. And I said, hey, we need to look into this organization. They sent me these really shady questions. And so we looked at them and we basically discovered that uh, NewsGuard is a, uh, a browser plugin that was being uh, launched by this company called NewsGuard that was directed by former CIA director Michael Hayden, former Secretary of Homeland Security Tom Ridge, and self-described chief propagandist for the Obama State Department Richard Stengel. And so these are the very people that brought us the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Patriot Act, the war on terror, uh, the crisis that we're seeing right now in Ukraine. And it was part of their so-called Defending Democracy Initiative um, that they wanted to fight fake news. And what their goals are for uh, NewsGuard is to rank websites based on, you know, are they uh, presenting fake news or truthful information? And of course, the way this organization is set up is that it's set up and founded by uh, the architects of the Iraq war and the, you know, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and the chief writers of uh, the Patriot Act. And so we knew that we could not trust them. But what they're trying to do is trying to make this uh, browser plugin uh, built in to all technological devices across the United States. They're already working with Microsoft now 
to get uh, NewsGuard to be on every single uh, Microsoft device. They're working with the US government to get uh, NewsGuard uh, browser plugin to be in all public libraries. And what this could mean for independent journalism, since we were ranked by NewsGuard, we received a red check mark, right? Or a red X, I should say, whereas the New York Times, the Washington Post, even Voice of America, the, the, the media outlets that are directly funded by US, the US government through the Board of Broadcasting Governors, which is basically a legal arm of US propaganda, they all received green check marks. Okay, so there's like a rating system based on color codes, just like the war on terror, you know, red is dangerous, green is, you know, safe. Um, and, and now they're going after independent media outlets and treating us as suspect. And why this is so dangerous is because actually NewsGuard partnered up with the Gallup, uh, with Gallup, and they actually did a, a study, and they found that if a website um, gets the green rating, people are likely to share that website's information. But if that website gets a red rating, then 70% of people are likely to not share that website they're, because they would be worried it would not be shared. Another reason why this is very worrisome is because if you get the red rating, NewsGuard will also advocate for financial institutions to block funding and advertising from your website because you're not trustworthy enough. You could be a dis, you know, accused of being a disinformation agent or spreading disinformation for Russia, whatever it is. So it really is a scary, you know, scary times for um, independent journalism, especially now with the new announcement of this Ministry of Truth that's being launched by, that's being head uh, and led by the Department of Homeland Security. And so I don't know what's ahead for us, but it, it really is scary times. Yes, absolutely. And I think an important thing for people to remember about NewsGuard is that its, uh, its funding comes from Publicist Group, which has, you know, is a, a, a massive, it's the third largest global communications company. Um, it's present in over 100 con uh, countries. It's got, you know, revenue of about $10 billion um, a year, generally. And, you know, its top clients range from uh, Pfizer to Starbucks, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, Burger King, and, you know, governments like Saudi Arabia and Australia. Um, the, the venture itself is, you know, from a partnership between Stephen Brill and Lewis Gordon Krovitz. Now, Krovitz worked at the Wall Street Journal. He also worked at the Dow Jones. Um, but in addition to that, he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and was also um, a, a, a contributor to books published by the American Enterprise Institute, which of course was instrumental in the US invasion of Iraq. So here we have really quite serious conflicts of interest of this organization, which is claiming to defend um, uh, truth, you know, and the one of the amazing things that I saw was them applying this green rating to the Voice of America, using the argument that the Voice of America legally within the United States is bound supposedly to um, report the truth. So here we have, you know, a sort of disfiguring of truth on an industrial scale and these organizations are the instruments through which that is able to happen i also wanted to ask you joe um how did it feel the other day to see somebody like trevor noah at the uh the whining and dining um at the white house next to joe biden talking about you know freedom of the press and how people in the united states should feel deeply privileged that they are a part of this exceptional society which allows that you know freedom of uh of of the press especially while julian assange has been languishing he suffered a stroke um a few months ago this man is languishing in belmarsh in this country where we have seen the the complete state capture of the judiciary with major conflicts of interest at work throughout what has happened to him there. It's been ruled in uh, the British courts that he will be extradited to the United States, despite the fact that a previous judge came to the conclusion that he was at a serious suicide risk if um, 
if I, extradited to should the I play the, Should I play the video for you guys? Do you guys want me to play it before we answer that question? Just Absolutely. Cause just because it's so Absolutely. ridiculous. <laughs> okay, one second. Let's get this on here. Yeah, so Menard is about to play this clip of Trevor Noah um, whining and dining with Biden, among others, and pontificating about the freedom of the press in the United States. Every single one of you, whether you like it or not, is a bastion of democracy. And if you ever begin to doubt your responsibilities, if you ever begin to doubt how meaningful it is, look no further than what's happening in Ukraine. Look at what's happening there. Journalists are risking and even losing their lives to show the world what's really happening. You realize how amazing it is. Like, in America, you, you have the right to seek the truth and speak the truth, even if it makes people in power uncomfortable, even if it makes your viewers or your readers uncomfortable. You understand how amazing that is? I stood here tonight and I made fun of the President of the United States, and I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine, right? <laughs> like, do you, like, do you really understand what a blessing it is? Maybe it's happened for so long that you, it might slip your mind. It's a blessing. In fact, here, ask yourself this question. Honestly, ask yourself this question. If, if Russian journalists who are losing their livelihoods, as you were talking about, Steve, and their freedom for daring to report on what their own government is doing, if they had the freedom to write any words, to show any stories, or to ask any questions, if they had basically what you have, would they be using it in the same way that you do? Ask yourself that question every day, because you have one of the most important roles in the world. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you. Look at that. Look well, at that. enough of that. Enough <laughs> of that self-satisfied, self-congratulatory bullshit. Joe, how did you feel watching that? Uh, well, I just ate something before I came on here, and it's about coming up in my throat right now. So I, I have to say I not, don't appreciate what Menard just did because my stomach is very queasy. Look, I haven't watched this. I'm trying to be polite. This we're, White House correspondence dinner for years. I don't watch it because uh, I know what it is. The last time I actually remember seeing something that I liked was Stephen Colbert when he took the piss out of the journalists uh, around the Gulf War. But don't forget, that was when the Republicans were in power. That's OK. You know, uh, you mentioned the Democratic Party before, uh, low key. And that is this is not the party of FDR anymore. There are still Democrats who think that it hasn't been the party of FDR since Bill Clinton move the party to the right, right with his Democratic Leadership Council. Tony Blair moved the Labour Party to the right with New Labour. Exact same process. But it's even worse now because in the 2016 election, we saw the migration of the neocons, which were firmly in the Republican Party and the George W. Bush administration, to the Democratic Party to back Hillary Clinton. So if you want to know which party that's worse, and they're both horrible, and we are very, it's very easy for us to be nonpartisan, which gets what it means is, because we hate both parties, so it's not a conflict for us. You look at where the neocons reside, and they reside in the Democratic Party right now. So when Trevor Noah got up there, in fact, I didn't know about his speech, because as I said, I personally boycott this thing, uh, until an Aaron Maté uh, tweet, and it said, and he quoted him, and then it said, except, he didn't quote him, he just Paraphrase what he said, except if you are Julian Assange, you have this freedom. So I thought, wow, Trevor Noah actually used his opportunity to stand up for Assange against them. So then I played the clip and, well, where's Assange? Yeah. See, the way Aaron had written it, I thought that he was mentioning Assange and he didn't. So that is a disgraceful performance by him. I think um, I stopped watching The Daily Show a long time ago. Uh, not since John Stewart was on, and he was sometimes good, but so I can't really pass my judgment on Trevor Noah, but uh, uh, I can on what that clip you just played. And uh, excuse me, because I have to go to the to the bathroom and barf right now. So, well, one thing, Joe. Also, you know, you had quite an interesting angle on the permanent war state within the U.S. when you were. Um, covering the work of Madeleine Albright between 1993 and 1997. You know, this is somebody who, of course, um, said that the sanctions 
on Iraq, which some estimates have killing over a million people. You know, she was asked, were the deaths of half a million Iraqi children worth it? And to which she responded that it was worth it. So, Joe, could you tell us a bit of what it was like to be personally around Madeleine <laughs> Albright during those years? Well, that's right. Her memorial service was last Wednesday, I believe. And uh, so I was thinking of writing this piece when she died. If that was a news hook, we also ran a couple of other pieces about her that day. Yeah, I was a uh, correspondent uh, at that time, I think for the German press agency, DPA, and the Daily Telegraph in London. Um, that was before I worked for the Globe and the Journal. But so Madeleine Albright is somebody who I was very uh, closely involved in as a correspondent covering her. And I had a lot of interactions with her. And some of them really stuck with me. And these are recollections that are almost 30 years old now. And yet they've never left me. And yes, I mentioned, of course, that statement about the 500,000 children dying and it was worth it. And I remember the reaction at the UN. It was, everyone was shocked by that. I mean, UN officials, diplomats from various countries, uh, uh, even American allies, like uh, a European diplomat. I can't even name him now. I think he's still alive. But I was at a background briefing with him, uh, with other reporters, and he called her an intellectual lightweight. This is a very close ally of the United States. So even amongst those countries that were lockstep with the U.S. at the U.N. Security Council. They didn't like her, at least this ambassador. And I remembered that that was supposed to stay in the room then, but within a few hours, I heard it circulating in the card is that uh, this ambassador called uh, Alberta intellectual lightweight. And uh, she would have been really hurt by that because she tried to pro project this image of the strong woman uh, who can be just as tough and smart as any male diplomat. Uh, you know, she also was trying to get the press to project that. She would invite Reporters like myself and two or three others with Jamie Rubin, who was her spokesperson at the time, who later became the State Department spokesman, um, to go out to drinks at a bar near the UN. And so, you know, they know how to try to finesse the reporters. But um, uh, she really locked horns with Boutros, Boutros Ghali, Egyptian Secretary General, who I covered also at that time. And he, I put him not in the same category, but very close, or at least on the list, the short list with Dag Hammarskjöld is the only secretary, secretary general in history that actually tried to stand up to all to both superpowers during the Cold War. That would have been the Soviets and the Americans, as Dag Hammarskjöld did, and it probably cost him his life uh, when his plane went down in Africa. And with uh, Boutros Ghali, who stood up to the United States, which at that time was the sole, just became the sole superpower because the Soviet Union had had fallen uh, just a few years. Before that, so uh, he actually had the guts to stand up to the U.S. And she um, was awful to him and tried to bring him down and did. Uh, the U.S. vetoed his second term. And she was uh, uh, saying that she would be friendly to him, but then break his legs after that. And uh, so he wrote a scathing uh, portrayal of Melanie O'Brien in his memoir, Vanquished, a U.S.-U.N. saga. The Serbs at the time also despised her. When she went, uh, she, because she was one of the, uh, as the U.N. ambassador advised the U.S. to allow the ethnic Serbs, uh, ethnic cleansing of 200,000 Serbs from Croatia during those days of the Balkan Wars. And when she went to uh, that area of Kraina in Croatia afterwards, she was stoned by remaining, her car was stoned by remaining Serbs. So this was the portrait I played of this woman, and I also ended it with the fact that she I, she came back to the UN many years later, around 2014, and I went to this small conference room with her, and she had a young female aide there, and she just treated her abominably, you know, just was basically glaring at her and pointing at her water glass, saying, you know, fill it, without saying any words. And this is the woman who said that it's a special place in hell for any woman who doesn't support Hillary Clinton for president, the champion feminist mistreating a young, uh, vulnerable uh, aide there. Uh, she wasn't a pleasant person. I waited a month till she died to say rude things about her. So I thought that was sufficient time. Um, no, I mean, yeah. absolutely. You know, yours is a vital and seasoned perspective, you know, and as someone that has observed U.S. politics, you have an example. Several months ago, I was looking into Abby Martin's confrontation with Nancy Pelosi and asking her about the leaving out of arms uh, uh, carbon emissions from the negotiations at the uh, the COP 
um, negotiations. And what I found was that both Nancy Pelosi and the other congressmen on the stage who attempted to answer Abby Martin's questions both had PACs that were funded by Raytheon, by Lockheed Martin, by arms companies. And what I also found was that across these, uh, these PACs that dominate US politics, the arms companies put loads of money everywhere. So in a system like this, can we really say that the United States is far from being the um, ideal democracy which it must import to the rest of the world? When you have this sort of system of legalized bribery, when you have what Sheldon Wallin called inverted totalitarianism, meaning we have no choice of voting against the interests of Raytheon or Lock Lockheed Martin, you know, with your experience, Joe, would you say the United States has any claim to call itself a democracy? Well, the short answer is no, uh, but it is more complicated than that. There is a system of representative government. There are elections, but even the elections have been so tainted now since the 2001 in Florida, really. Uh, since then. There hasn't been one that wasn't uh, contested, that wasn't controversial, that didn't have a lot of uh, uh, allegations around, including the John Kerry, uh, George Bush one, whether there was some tampering with the computer there. Uh, you know, th so even that part of it, and that's just a one small part of a democracy. You have to have an independent judiciary. You need to have separation between the military and civilians. We still more or less have that uh, in the U.S. So there are still elements of that. But when it comes, and by the way, I thank the Pentagon for saving our lives so far, because they're the ones who are tamping down all this madness from the press and from some Democrats and other members of Congress and Republicans included who, who are trying to push a war against Russia a no-fly zone, sending Polish planes in there, now pouring so much, so many guns in there, and this a uh, this Kinzinger's bill where there the could be triggered war with Russia, and this absolute blasé attitude towards nuclear war, which is scaring the hell out of any sentient being. Uh, so the U.S. system is corrupted by money. You gave some examples there, of which there are many. The whole political system is absolutely corrupt. Both parties are bought and sold is very, very few really independent voices in Congress. And if you get one more or less like a Bernie Sanders, it was very disappointing for a lot of people, but he was still, he was what I would call FDR Democrat, which given what we've got of the Democratic Party today, it's huge progress, um, but he was crushed. The first time, as we know from WikiLeaks, by the, uh, the machinations of the DNC. And the second time when Obama called the others and said, drop out because we got to we got to have a centrist. And by the way, if you go back to November of the previous year of the election, 20, uh, 2019, all these Democratic operatives were wheeled out on the on MSNBC and CNN saying, no, Joe Biden doesn't have it anymore. It looks like there's some mental uh, debilitation there. So they were trying to push Harris or Buttigieg, or then Klobuchar became the flavor of the month. The New York Times started pushing. None of them got traction. Bernie was killing them. He won the first two primaries. Mm -hmm. Usually that, when you win New Hampshire and Iowa, that's like your ticket to the uh, nomination. And yet they had to find some centrist. So Obama got on the phone, told him all the jet back, except Elizabeth Warren, by the way, because she would siphon some votes from Bernie. And then guess who became the nominee? Uh, the guy that they had previously said didn't have it anymore. And we could see uh, his, his mental condition right now. It's kind of sad to see a guy up there like that. And it's also dangerous because of the what I just discussed about nuclear war, etc. So it's not a, a, a functioning democracy in the wider sense. Certainly it's not a direct democracy, but even as a representative democracy, it's corrupted by money uh, so that real independent voices are shut out and you're co-opted. And when you, I wrote a book of Senator Mike Gravel, who died last year, and he gave me many, many insights into how the Congress works. And, uh, and the, even in those, his days in the 1970s, the pressure, but there was a lot more vocal and independent kind of Congress then. You had real independent voices there. Uh, that's gone. I mean, that Congress is, was a dream compared to what we've got now, so America is not spreading democracy around the world. Anyone who believes that needs to go back to kindergarten and learn the alphabet again. They are spreading a uh, geostrategic and economic interests uh, and spreading a neoliberal, let me cautiously neoliberal, I mean economic system. Neoliberal is not political because the Republicans are neoliberals. It just means you don't want government inside. It's laissez-faire, what it used to be called laissez-faire. There's a lot of confusion in America about neoliberal means. They're not talking about political liberals. They're talking about economic liberalism. And that is 
what is being spread and instituted everywhere. And then you've got the neocons who are particularly disastrous. Everywhere they've gone, they've left behind a trail of destruction and huge margins for the defense contractors and others. Absolutely, that's not the only motive. They want to bring down governments that are standing in the way of the United States unilateral power that's written in their founding document project for New American Century, the president of which was Robert Kagan, whose wife is Victoria Nuland, who was the motivating force behind the Ukraine coup in 2014 and has a hand in this war again as she is uh, Obama. She has in a position in Obama State Department now as well. By the way, her grandfather is from Ukraine, uh, from the um, Bessarabia region of Ukraine, bordering now on Romania, Moldova. And this, uh, her grandfather was kicked out uh, by a, a czarist pogrom against Jews. Horrible. He went to settle in the Bronx, New York, where I grew up. And her, grand, her father was, uh, you know, psychologically abused by the grandfather. And one could argue that maybe Newland's, you know, animosity towards Russia goes back to those, what happened in Ukraine. Uh, that doesn't, that doesn't completely explain her. But the neocons, are in the Democratic Party. They're driving a disastrous and dangerous foreign policy that could lead to nuclear annihilation right now. And I don't say that lightly. You know, Bob Perry wrote a piece back in 2015 about that the Ukraine situation and the Russian-US tension and Russiagate, which is really the beginning of this, the beginning of what we've been talking about, what this whole program is about, about the suppression of an independent voice in the media, goes started really in a big way in Russiagate. And then also the pressure and tensions leading to Russia began there in a big way. Uh, and then with the coup, first the coup and then Russiagate. And Bob wrote, at that time, this could you want to have a nuclear war over Ukraine? And I thought he was going over the top. But that article is unbelievable prescient. Now that, that's what we're talking about. Uh, I wish he was here to see that he was right. About, well, I'm, he would be horrified as we all are. Uh, but it's not a democracy in a sense that we would want it to be. And they're not spreading democracy. They're spreading their system of... Uh, a repressive system of political um, neoconservatism and economic neoliberalism and, and trying to stop any powers that get in their way. And that would be Russia and China primarily. And they're putting you know, enormous pressure on India too, because they're not joining in with the American side. The non-aligned movement, which is having a kind of resurgence now, is another target, as it was in the first Cold War, of the United States. And so th they want no obstacles. And I think sometimes they act like this is the China of 30 years ago, or the Russia of the Yeltsin age is what they want to reconstitute. Biden has made a clear regime change in Moscow is the purpose of this. He not only blurted it out in Poland, said it directly, and they try to walk it back, but he said it in the February 24 press conference, the day of the Russian invasion. He was asked, oh, why do you think the sanctions would work now when they didn't prevent the invasion? He said the sanctions were never meant to to uh, prevent the invasion, it's to show the Russian people, cause pain, show them what he has done to them. That's what this is all about. So he being Putin, this is to get the Russian people to rise up against Putin. This is the whole idea of why they wanted Russia to invade, in my opinion, because they would not have been able to unleash this economic war and information war to bring down the government of Russia. This is what the end game is, and they're using Ukrainians to die and fight for them as a proxy war and they're not going to give up. They're not going to go into negotiations. Ukraine could have perhaps gotten out of this if they agreed to give up Crimea and the Donbass and to put in their constitution that they're a neutral country that will never join NATO. Those were the terms that Russia offered. But And I think there were maybe Zelensky wanted to do that. He said so. But then five minutes later, he said he didn't. And then five minutes later, he changed his mind again. So what pressure was he under from Boris Johnson, from uh, the State Department, from maybe neo-Nazis inside Ukraine, not to give in to the Russians and fight to the death? And, and risk nuclear war. This is where we're at. And in the meantime, shut up voices like Mint Press News and Consortium News that are trying to explain this. That's all we're trying to do. I'll explain this, not promoting or taking a side of the Absolutely. government. You know, we're not allowed to do that. Absolutely. Well, we are. We're sure. still doing it, but they don't want us to. And, and Manar, you wanted to make a comment about this Wall Street Journal uh, piece about uh, nuclear war. Yeah, so uh, at Mint Press, we conducted a study about uh, the authors of the many uh, pro-NATO um, articles that have that are you know um, that are taking a foot in the mainstream corporate media. And one of those outlets that we studied was the Wall Street Journal. And as Joe <laughs> pointed out, uh, these outlets are openly 
you know, promoting the idea of nuclear war with Russia. And this is a perfect example of how uh, an article written by Seth Cropsey, who is a lobbyist, right? He's a lobbyist for the Hudson Institute, one of the most hawkish and most dangerous uh, lobby uh, think tanks, actually, in uh, the United States that promotes uh, a Cold War with Russia. He has written this article here, the U.S. should show it can win a nuclear war. And part of our coverage, our study of these authors um, that have written these opinion pieces in the Wall Street Journal, in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, is that 90% of these authors that are promoting a Cold War with Russia, who are promoting NATO, who are basically uh, painting Putin as Hitler incarnate, are tied to lobbyist groups um, that are funded uh, by uh, NATO themselves. So this guy, I mean, I, I, his, his uh, background is he, he served as an assistant to the Secretary of Defense in the Reagan administration and as Deputy uh, Undersecretary of the Navy for policy in 1984, where he was responsible for maritime strategy, strategic education, defense reorganization, and special operations capabilities. He was commissioned as an officer in the Naval Reserve and during the George Bush um, administration, Cropsey served as principal deputy assistant secretary of Gen defense for special operations and low intensity uh, conflicts. Um, he also worked as a propagandist within the U.S. government in 2005. He served as a director of international broadcasting for the U.S. government. And now he's currently a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and director of Hudson Center for American Sea Power. And so when it comes to a functioning democracy, we cannot have a functioning democracy with a mainstream corporate media that represents the interests of the permanent war state that is funded, uh, that are people that are funded uh, directly by NATO funded think tanks and uh, receiving money from weapons manufacturers. The whole point of having a free press is to act as a watchdog to those in power to represent the interests of uh, the people that's what having a fourth estate is, not the way that Trevor Noah thinks um, that the free press should act as. So, um, And that's why there's such a, a, a heavy-handed uh, crackdown on dissent is to control this kind of narrative and to ensure that any sort of alternative narrative to the war machine completely disappears. And of course, the Hudson Institute is also funded by the world's second largest arms company, Raytheon. So there we have it. Um, you what know, a people, what a coincidence, <laughs> all over the place are trying to essentially push us into a nuclear confrontation, which would serve absolutely no one. Uh, Manar and Joe, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's been a really great session with you both i would urge all the viewers online now to support mint press through patreon through the other means which exist and also to support consortium news and joe as much as you can it's a rough ride but we are here till the end thank you very much for joining us thank